speech to AIPAC in Washington, a familiar tune. The Israeli Prime Minister pushes for higher pressure on Tehran and calls for Palestinians to recognize its Jewish state. The crisis in Ukraine continues. Putin insists Russia has all rights to use all means to protect its citizens in Ukraine as U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry lands in Kiev and warns the Russian president. And an Egyptian court bans Hamas, the Palestinian offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, as military strongman Abdel Fattah Sisi inches closer to a presidential run. The News Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening. As part of a five-day trip to the United States, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke a short while ago to AIPAC, America's most significant pro-Israel lobbying organization. It follows an Oval Office meeting yesterday with U.S. President Barack Obama. Here's some of what Netanyahu had to say. My friends, I believe that letting Iran enrich uranium would open up the floodgates. It really would open up a Pandora's box of nuclear proliferation in the Middle East and around the world. That must not happen. And we will make sure it does not happen. I said that the greatest threat to our common security is that of a nuclear-armed Iran. We must prevent Iran from having the capability to produce nuclear weapons. And I want to reiterate that point, not just to prevent them from having the weapon, but to prevent them from having the capacity to make the weapon. So those ICBMs that they're building, they're not intended for us. You remember that beer commercial? This Bud's for you? Well, when you see Iran building ICBMs, just remember America, that's God's for you. Iran is on the table, of course, again. And our I-24 News diplomatic correspondent has been in D.C. for both the Netanyahu and Obama meeting yesterday. And this speech, of course, today, she joins us live right now from Washington. Good evening, Tal. So what was the emphasis of Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech in AIPAC? Good evening, Lucy. It might be a clue to what went on in the Oval Office yesterday, but Netanyahu's speech today here at the AIPAC convention was quite gentle, and there weren't too many new headlines. He mentioned all of the usual elements, of course, Iran, the Middle East peace process, and the boycott attempts on Israel, um, but he didn't give much new on each one of them. On Iran, the divisions between Israel and the U.S. remain. Netanyahu insists that Iran should be dismantled from all uh, its capacity to build a nuclear weapon, while the administration is ready to commit only to preventing the weapon itself. On the Middle East peace process, Netanyahu did commend Kerry's efforts and thanked the U.S. Secretary of State that never sleeps. He said that Israel is pro-peace and that it's the Palestinians who have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. He put an extra emphasis on the opportunities of peace with the Arab world, which is a, a new uh, talking point. Um, and the last part of his speech, the most enthusiastic one, was the uh, one regarding the BD yes, boycott movement. He said this is the last chapter in the history of anti-Semitism, but promised the audience that the boycott movement will fail and that Israel's best economic days are still ahead. Yeah, you're saying that he promised the audience. And thought we can say that the prime minister's speech was a home game concerning how did the crowd react to the speech. Well, yes, the APAC convention is probably Netanyahu's favorite audience. It, audience. It's the biggest Jewish convention in the world. And for three days now, they have been uh, chanting and uh, repeating their slogan. This year's slogan is, I am pro-Israel, I am APAC. So they were very enthusiastic about Netanyahu's speech. There were numerous rounds of applause and standing ovations. Um, Netanyahu is definitely the uh, highlight of this three-day convention and of the event. And he spoke exactly 
about their concerns. He also spiced it up with slogans and gimmicks. Um, he repeated a, a, a slogan from two years ago, nuclear duck. He talked about the BDS uh, initial, saying it's bigotry, dishonesty, and shame. And of course, mentioned Scarlett Johansson, the American Jew's latest hero following the Soda Stream events. So the warm and embracing chemistry will probably reinv reinvigorate uh, both Netanyahu that's on his way to the West Coast, to Hollywood, Hollywood in the Silicon Valley, and the APAC activists that are traditionally move on from the convention center to Capitol Hill to lobby their representatives on the Hill for Israel. Back to you. Yes, Dal, thank you very much uh, for this. And of course, you're keep on updating us. Uh, and we're moving. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's speech in front of the APAC convention was a major stop in his visit to the United States. Surprisingly, his meeting yesterday with President Barack Obama was m warmer than anticipated, or so it seems. I-24 News correspondent Oni Ben Massad with more. We will not permit Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon, period. <laughs> The atmosphere around Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to the United States has been warmer than expected. Speaking at the annual APEC conference in Washington, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry made strong and clear points, both regarding his administration's obligation to prevent Iran from gaining a nuclear weapon and its commitment to the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. We are at a point in history that requires the United States, as Israel's closest friend, and the world's preeminent power to do everything we can to help end this conflict once and for all. But the real surprise was in the White House during Netanyahu's meeting with President Barack Obama. Only 24 hours after Obama unleashed harsh criticism of Netanyahu's policy conducting the peace talks in an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg, it seemed the president had a change of heart. Prime Minister Netanyahu has approached these negotiations with uh, a level of seriousness uh, and commitment uh, that reflects his leadership and uh, the desire for the Israeli people uh, for peace. Why the sudden change in attitude? The criticizing interview with Goldberg may have been published on Sunday, but it was conducted on Thursday afternoon, before the crisis between Russia and Ukraine came to its height. Obama was suddenly drawn to a new front, opening in Eastern Europe, and softened his approach towards Israel, at least for public appearances. While what was said to Netanyahu behind closed doors may have resembled the Goldberg interview, to the cameras, Obama preserved a smile, allowing the Israeli prime minister to reiterate his positions. Israel has been doing its part, and I regret to say that the Palestinians haven't. As far as the visit goes, the Israeli prime minister may have dodged a bullet. But the deadline to reach a framework agreement is due in April. And by then, Netanyahu is sure to experience another level of pressure. Yes. And after much anticipation, Egypt's army chief, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, all but officially announced his presidential run. Al-Sisi said today that he could not ignore demands that he run for president and will take official measures soon. He has become a leading powerful figure in Egypt since the ouster of former President Mohamed Morsi and has enjoyed widespread support for a potential presidential run. And we're staying in Egypt. An Egyptian court on Tuesday banned the Palestinian Islamist group Hamas. It marks the latest in Egypt's crackdown on the group, which is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. More in this report by I-24 News correspondent Charles Biblizer. Hamas has been dealt a major blow, and this time not by Israel. An Egyptian court has designated the Palestinian group a terror organization and banned its activities in Egypt. Hamas rejects the ruling. We expect Egypt to support the Palestinian resistance and not behave as it is now. We affirm that we are not respecting this. Cairo's military-backed government accuses Hamas of aiding militants in the Sinai Peninsula who have conducted a wave of attacks on security forces since the ouster of Islamist President Mohamed Morsi last July. For his part, Morsi is currently standing trial on charges of conspiring to stage the attacks with Hamas, which is the Palestinian offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Since reassuming power, the Egyptian army has launched a fierce crackdown on Gaza's rulers, aiming to destroy its network of smuggling tunnels and banning its officials from traveling to Egypt altogether. Tuesday's decision is the culmination of this process and likely marks the end, at least for now, of the once strong Cairo-Gaza relationship. The United States uh, Secretary of State uh, John Kerry arrived today in Kiev and offered Ukraine one billion dollars in loan backing. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin, in his first public appearance since the crisis began, said that all options are on the table. Summarizing another tense day in Eastern Europe is I-24 News correspondent Uri Shapira. The definition of war is being challenged once again today in Ukraine. As Russian forces continue their activities in the Crimean Peninsula, Russian President Vladimir Putin insists that his country did not invade Ukraine and he still sees the East European country as one of his closest allies. What can be a reason to use the armed forces? This is of course the last resort, simply the last resort. In his first public appearance since the crisis began, Putin claimed that as far as he is concerned, all options are on the table. He also called the Ukrainian transition of power a coup and said he is in touch with Assad Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych. I've already said this and I want to repeat that the legitimate president in purely legal terms is of course Yanukovych. In spite of the continuing provocations in the Crimean Peninsula, it seems that Putin and his administration took a step back. Today, the Russian troops that were spread across the Ukrainian border were sent back home from the large military drill that took place over the last few days. However, Ukrainian officials are convinced that the Russian invasion, so far without any casualties, is a declaration of war. We we believe this is a war, a war against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. It cannot be called any other way. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry arrived today to Kiev to try to ease the fire in the region. The United States will stand by the Ukrainian people as they build the strong, sovereign and democratic country that they deserve and that their countrymen and women just so recently gave their lives in extraordinarily courageous acts. Kerry offered the loan of $1 billion to Ukraine, but as days go by, the Russians are maintaining their activities in the peninsula and the fog of war is not clearing. Stop, stop, stop. Joining me live from Kiev is I-24 News Special Envoy Jacob. A long good evening, Jacob. So the United States Secretary of State announced a $1 billion aid loan package to Ukraine. What was the reaction to this uh, U.S. stance? Yes, Lucy, good evening from uh, Kiev. Uh, of course, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry was uh, very welcome here. And it was also a symbolic gesture. He went down to Independence Square, right here in the heart of Kiev, to um, see firsthand what has been going on, to meet people. And as you have mentioned, it was more than a symbolic gesture. He came with a hefty uh, financial package, $1 billion in uh, loan guarantees to the Ukrainian government, which is in dire need for economic help. It is foggy and sub-freezing temperatures uh, in the uh, heart of Kiev this evening, and it, frankly, the whole situation is quite murky. At the same time that uh, Kerry was here, Vladimir Putin spoke today. He kept his options open. He said that any measures could be taken, uh, and he kept everybody guessing as, uh, as usual. But uh, in the morning time here in Kiev, actually, people uh, woke up to good news because uh, Russia has announced that uh, they were uh, pulling uh, Russian troops from the western uh, border of Russia with Ukraine. But the Ukrainian government keeps uh, informing everybody that uh, about 16,000 Russian troops are still in the uh, Crimea Peninsula. So we had a lot of talks today and little progress. We'll so see. the feeling in the West is that the threat of war in one way or another eased, is it the same in Kiev? 
Uh, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. People are skeptical. See, uh, things can, you know, um, deteriorate quite rapidly. It's a lot of talk. It's double talk. It's it's um, disinformation. It's spins. It's a lot of diplomacy and anti-diplomacy. I wouldn't call this a very successful day. We we never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yes, uh, Jacob uh, Elon, thank you very much for this and keep warm. And Jacob Elon uh, has an exclusive interview tonight on One on One with the former Ukrainian pre President Viktor Yushchenko, who led the Ukrainian Orange Revolution that began in November 2004. Here's a preview. Putin is now building his new realm, the new Russian Empire. And without Ukraine, this plan cannot be achieved. Without Ukraine, we cannot imagine the Eurasian space that Putin is building. Without Ukraine, we can't imagine the customs union he is establishing. Without Ukraine, we can't imagine the political bloc of the future country members of the new Russian Empire. The Iraqi city of Samara became the scene of a hostage crisis today. Suicide bombers broke into city council headquarters and took several employees hostage. One blew himself up at the door while a car bomb blew up a police vehicle outside the building. At least five people were left dead and dozens wounded. Joining me right now for a look inside Israel's I-24 News correspondent, Eli Ochenberg. Good evening, Eli. Today we will discuss the issue of Shabbat, the Jewish day of rest in modern times. It is possible to ban businesses from opening on Saturday and prevent the non-religious public to enjoy everyday activities such as shopping. Eli, before we will uh, answer this question, let's see your report. Breaking the status quo. After Israeli Supreme Court ordered it to either enforce its bylaws or adjust them, the Tel Aviv municipality proposed an amendment that allows stores to be open on Shabbat and holidays. Befitting to its second name, the city that never sleeps, it now lets grocery stores and kiosks open on Saturday, but imposes limits on how many such institutes can open on each street. We are counting on Shabbat. There are a lot of customers. It is very problematic if you close on Shabbat. I'm closed on Sunday, for example, because because I need a day off. But there are stores that are open all week long. Previously, petitions argued that opening supermarkets on Saturday violates the provisions, according to Jewish law, to have at least one day off. The Supreme Court ruled last June that the municipality must impose stronger penalties on businesses that operate on Shabbat, yet emphasized that it was not taking a side in the debate over the place of religion in Israel. But that was inevitable. A similar struggle is taking place in Jerusalem, where hundreds of petitioners are trying to allow the new cinema city complex, a major movie theater and shopping center, to open on Saturdays. Though the building permit included a requirement from the Jerusalem municipality and the finance ministry that it remain closed on Saturday, the secular community in the holy city is demanding it stays open, arguing they also have the right to enjoy their Shabbat. The matter has already reached the Israeli Supreme Court and a hearing on the petition is expected around March 10th. So, Eli, why? Why is it such a big issue in the Israeli society? Well, Lucy, this regulation uh, practically legalized what has been happening uh, happening here in Israel for the past several years, but reopens the biggest question of all. Should Israel be a Jewish democratic state or just democratic? Ever since uh, Israel was established, it preserves the status quo, which is the political understanding between the secular and orthodox parties to not alter the uh, communal agreement uh, in all related to religion, uh, it deals with um, uh, with marriage, with uh, with uh, kosher, and of course with the Shabbat. According to the status quo, uh, governmental and municipal offices are uh, closed on Shabbat. There is no public transportation, and this issue is um, making uh, the Israeli society very busy and Definitely. maybe the core of the rift between the secular and the orthodox. Uh, public, uh, every time this uh, issue arises, it, uh, may, it brings all uh, sides very, very close to the boiling point. Let's hear what uh, some Israelis have to say about this issue. Let's I think restaurants and public transportation should work on Saturday. All the other places need to be closed. 
It's a matter of faith. Everyone should follow his personal faith. If people are uncomfortable with certain places being open on Saturday, like in conservative areas, we can respect their will. It's a big issue here in Tel Aviv, yes, we a, have to say. A very, very big issue here in Tel Aviv because it's a city with a majority of secular public, but also in Jerusalem, a mixed city with extremists on both sides, an uh, issue that will probably stay with us. Eli Ochomer, of course, you will be with us with another inside subject, Israeli subject, uh, inside Israel. Thank you very much for this. And we're going out for a small break, two minutes break. The news today, don't go anywhere. Two minutes and I'll be back. In a speech to AIPAC in Washington, a familiar tune, the Israeli Prime Minister pushes for higher pressure on Tehran and calls for Palestinians to recognize a Jewish state. The crisis in Ukraine continues. Putin insists Russia has all the right to use all means to protect its citizens in Ukraine as U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry lands in Kiev and warns the Russian president. An Egyptian court bans Hamas, the Palestinian offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, as military strongman Abdel Fattah al-Sisi inches closer to a presidential run. And we're moving on. Saudi Prince Al Walid ibn Talal visited the West Bank today after an invitation from Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. The Saudi billionaire met with Abbas and a delegation of Palestinian businessmen, in addition to laying a wreath at the grave of former President Yasser Arafat. The PA's Deputy Prime Minister for Econ Economic Affairs, Mohammed Mustafa, spoke of his appreciation for the prince's help in building the institutions of the future Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital. And joining me right now from Ramallah is senior Fatah official Ahmed Ghanem. Good evening. Good evening. So, uh, Mr. Ghanem, what kind of investments is the Saudi prince looking for the pa in the Palestinian Authority? It's a very important visit to the occupation territory and to uh, Palestine. Especially in that time, the uh, prince had come to uh, encourage the, uh, the peace process, uh, especially, and to encourage the Palestinian leadership to continue uh, with its position for calling for justice, peace, and keeping the rights of the Palestinian uh, people. And uh, he um, signed by his assistant an agreement uh, with the agriculture ministry in Palestine. So, uh, you know, recently there was a report published about the corruption in the Palestinian Authority. Does he know that maybe his money is not going to the investments that he really wants to happen in the Palestinian Authority? I advise you and the others to stop talking about corruption in Palestine because we are maybe the main country who is fighting against the corruption in this region. and. Uh, uh, try to focus uh, uh, for about uh, corruption in Israel and other countries. In Palestine, we have a special partner for fighting against corruption, and he knows that his money is going to the right direction. So uh, let's uh, try to look at it in a different way. Was it a political visit, threatening ties between the Palestinian Authority and Saudi Arabia? Uh, we have a very uh, important uh, relation with the uh, president in Saudi Arabia and uh, King Abdullah himself is following the situation in the uh, in Palestine and we are working and cooperating with each other and uh, uh, especially uh, with the acceptance of uh, uh, 67 countries, uh, Arab and Islamic countries, the uh, Arab initiative which has been prepared by Saudi itself and uh, we are calling uh, in this uh, uh, opportunity yes. for the Israeli side to, uh, to accept yes. the uh, uh, Arab initiative and to continue. Yes. 
احمد احمد غنيم ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ذس فون كول وذ اس And we're moving back to Israel. Israeli Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman is set to convene a meeting of his Israel Beitenu party to discuss the possibility of splitting from uh, with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud. The breakup would mark the end of um, what has been sometimes tr turbulent partnership. I-24 News correspondent Charles Bibles reports. <laughs> We are standing before huge challenges, and it is time to join forces for the benefit of the nation. This is why the Likud and Israel Beitenu will run together as one party in the next elections. It was a union that propelled Benjamin Netanyahu and Avigdor Lieberman to Israel's top government posts. But on Tuesday, a decision is expected to ultimately end it. Israeli Foreign Minister Lieberman has convened his Israel Beitenu party to decide whether to go it alone in the next election cycle. Lieberman's party united with Prime Minister Netanyahu's Likud in October 2012, just months before a national vote. The joint list went on to win a plurality of 31 seats in parliament and with it the opportunity to form the current coalition government. But the election outcome was a disappointment, with the parties losing a combined 11 mandates. The union has proceeded to be rocky, with constant rumors of an impending breakup. Lieberman's move comes with polls showing both parties would receive significantly more seats in the next parliament if they run separately. They say that nothing lasts forever. And when it comes to the Likud Beitenu, this is looking increasingly so. American Economy magazine Forbes came out with its new classic list of the richest, richest people on the planet, and Bill Gates is uh, topping it once again. I-24 News reporter Uri Shapira looks at the list you probably want to miss. Some hold blacklists, some have a hit list, but here's a list you'll definitely want to see your name on. Forbes Business magazine published Monday the World Billionaires list of 2014. Major surprises, as expected, were hard to find. Number one on the list is American computer giant Bill Gates, who is worth no less than $76 billion. Gates returned to the top after four years in second place. Number two is Mexican tycoon Carlos Slim, who owns some of the biggest telecommunication companies in the world. Slim's fortune is estimated at $72 billion. Number three on the list, Amancio Ortega, only three years in the top five, with a net worth standing at $64 billion. And what about Facebook's famous CEO? Apparently the young Mark Zuckerberg did well this year and almost doubled his net worth to $28.5 billion thanks to wise investments and the success of Facebook stocks this year. Facing these massive figures, it is easy to turn to sarcasm and bitterness. The truth is that many of the people on the list are also great philanthropists. Gates himself has donated around $28 billion so far. Either way, humility is not on this list. With this positive note, with me now uh, for a look at economy is uh, Natalie Ehrlich. Good evening. Good evening. Thank so, you. So, uh, Natalie, of course, we're uh, dealing with the Ukrainian crisis, and we want to understand tonight um, how are the global markets are going to actually affect. Uh, um, uh, be affected from uh, the crisis in Ukraine. Absolutely. So what we saw today that generally happened, markets across the globe, even Russia's, were rebounding because markets generally priced in that this crisis has now stabilized. Mm -hmm. And something that's really interesting that happened yesterday is that when there was an escalation, the markets tanked. Uh, and there's uh, today there's a reversal of, of all the moves that investors made yesterday. So what happens when we face these kind of geopolitical pressures and tensions whether it's the Madrid bombings or the Lehman collapse or the Ukraine crisis, Syria crisis for that matter, investors are flocking to what we call our safe haven. So that's typically gold, oil, uh, even the U.S. dollar that we saw yesterday, U.S. treasuries. And I will add the thing that's really interesting, Yes. not to... Uh, 
uh, override this, but there was so much criticism that the Obama administration faced in light of this crisis, and ultimately, it almost came out, the, the economy of the U.S. came out a winner. You know, the, the economy is always connected to politics, but can it predict if a situation is going to get better or not, like in this case? Well, investors and uh, policy maker, makers can look to the economy and uh, also the markets uh, for indications of what can happen next. It's almost like a symbiotic relationship. One trader pointed out uh, in the today, actually, his name is um, Hans Olsen, and he's with Barclays. He made a really interesting statement. He said that Putin takes a 19th century approach to handling conflict, and the markets take a 21st century approach. And so what he believes is that the markets actually did a better job at bringing Putin to the table rather than diplomats. So uh, could this, you think, um, uh, could this crisis spell market opportunity for investors? Yeah, I mean, potentially, the thing is, Today, it does seem like that, that this crisis has been contained for to some extent, that it's de-escalated. But what happens is, like what we saw yesterday, people were running for safe havens. It's almost like a crowd-thinking situation. Everyone's running to these safe havens, like the U.S. Uh, dollar and gold and whatnot. They're running yeah. out of the stock market. So people like Warren Buffett, also one of the richest men in the world, like uh, similar to your report, they are advocating that people jump into the stock market to swoop in and get the best deals. It's almost like a flash sale. So you get Gucci and Prada for almost <laughs> Ann Taylor prices. So uh, should we uh, predict, like, uh, if we're trying to predict what will happen maybe in the next few days in the Ukrainian uh, uh, market, uh, stock market, what can, we, what should we expect? Well, I think that it can serve as an indicator. I mean, it's a, not an end-all, be-all, but, you know, today when I looked at the markets first, rather, you can almost not even look at the headlines sometimes. If you see that the markets are suddenly up, you know that this situation has calmed itself down. Depends. Uh, where are you in the world? Uh, Natalie Ehrlich, thank you very much uh, for this, for this insight. Yes, 100 days, that is uh, the time until the kickoff of the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, and fans are already getting impatient. Ori Bao from, I, the, from the I-24 News Sports Magazine reports. There is a carnival atmosphere in Brazil these days as the country counts down 100 days to the start of the 2014 World Cup. Even Ronaldo dropped by for some carnival fun in Sao Paulo as part of his activities as an ambassador for the tournament. However, not everything is fun in games, as the South American giant still faces problems before the games begin on June 12th. Not all the stadiums are prepared, and the arena de Baixada and Coritiba was saved by the bell before their right to host the games was provoked. The stadium preparations are still in process, and time is running out even though FIFA executives are still optimistic. At the end of the day, Brazil's image in the World Cup will be delivered by what people see here during the World Cup. And in terms of stadiums, they will see 12 beautiful stadiums, modern stadiums. Stadium readiness is not the only issue Brazil has to deal with. The ongoing protests in the country opposing the World Cup continue as the voices get louder by the day. We want education, health, security, the basics that the government has always refused to give us in Brazil. I don't want any more protests until the government understands that we don't want the World Cup. We have other priorities in this country. While the protests continue in Sao Paulo, the Rio de Janeiro police hold drills simulating violent protests which are expected to take place during the tournament all part of a no-nonsense approach by the Brazilian government concerning its security measures. Our preoccupation is to prevent violent actions during the protests. In that way, we have adopted a series of techniques so that, I repeat it, we can guarantee the legitimacy of the peaceful and organized protests so we can forbid any act of vandalism or violence. Brazil has a long way to go till everything is set and done. And even though the road looks rocky now, in three months, 32 teams will take part in football's biggest event, and the country will keep on dancing to the samba beat. And joining me right now is the host of I-24 News Sports Magazine, Jonathan Regev. Hi. Hello, Jonathan. evening. Good evening. So you are counting the days as yeah. well? Yes, I am. 100 days to go. It's, it's a real feast for, for us football enthusiasts. It is. And, and we love it, and we expect it, and we're going to sit down and watch every game. 
Do you but like to sit down and watch every game? Most of them. I mean, I'm, I'm at work so, uh, <laughs> most of the time, but even then, uh, you know, to take a sneak peek on TV. Uh, but but um, uh, 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 for Brazilians, this, the, it's, it's, it's a big problem. It's an issue. We saw on the, on the report. Infrastructure is far from being ready. We're talking about the stadiums because they have to be ready on time. Few people think about the airports. The airports, especially the ones in Rio and Sao Paulo, they're old, they're outdated, they're overcrowded today, right now, before hundreds of thousands of people come in. 100 days before. 100 days, yeah, there, there's no time to upgrade them. But that's, that's, what, that's what there is and that's what they'll have to live with. And you know, I have to tell you that we should have hope because I-24 News was built in 100 days, so. Not everybody's I-24 news. Right. Not everybody's <laughs> I-24 news. So uh, let's move to LeBron James. LeBron James. You know, he has, he, he won every possible thing. He already won two straight NBA championships, numerous MVPs, but apparently there's always a record to break, and he did it last night. He scored 61 points against the Charlotte Bobcats. LeBron James is playing with a broken nose. He played the last three games with a mask to protect his nose, and it's, the, the mask just, it's like Jim Curry. I mean, it, it just uplifted his game. He scored 61 points against Charlotte, and, wow. and let's hear what he had to say right after the game. Let's hear. You know, it felt like I, was, it felt like I had a golf ball thrown into the ocean. <laughs> you know, so, especially in that third quarter, you know, um, at one point I pulled up behind the three-point line probably like 30 feet, and, uh, you know, when that one went in, I knew, um, I was in a really, really good groove. You know, I felt like good I group. The, the, there's a chance that even I would score a golf ball to the ocean, maybe. Um, well, it was a good game, I have to say. Yeah, but I, uh, let's. Uh, there are two legends who met for um, Legends what, of Tennis, met what, again. I think the, that for a romantic, da romantic yes, date in yes, London. Yes, 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 of course. No. Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras. <laughs> no. 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 Okay. Uh, they met for the World Tennis Day. It's 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 a day meant to, to build more enthusiasm for tennis, and it's working. And there are always big events in that game. And yesterday in London, um, Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi met. For all of us tennis fans, fans who, who were still following tennis in the 90s, this was one of the biggest rivalries ever. They faced each other 34 times as professionals. Sampras won 20 games, Agassi won 14, but their rivalry, they, they were both American players. Every, every one of their game was always contested. Very different styles of play. And they met again in London, in Earl's Court this time. London, obviously a big venue for them because they did meet each other twice in Wimbledon, mm -hmm. also in London, once in the final, 1990, 1999. Pete Sampras won it. And every time they face each other, it's, it's nice. It brings up a lot of nostalgia. They were probably two of the best players, if not the best of the 90s. Agassi won this game, by the way, but the game is not really important. It's all the hype around it. You know, uh, you said something at the beginning about uh, the World Cup, and it's it's a good thing for you that you're the sports magazine anchor. So when we will see you watching football and enjoying it, and when my it's because you're working, <laughs> of course I was working. And you can tell your wife at home, I'm working. I'm, I'm working. I have to working. watch the game. It's of it's course. out of my choice. Of course, Jonathan Regev. Thank, thank you very much. Thank for you, this. Lucy. During the Second World War, the Japanese government forced thousands of women, perhaps as many as 200,000 from various countries in Asia, to become sex slaves for Japanese soldiers. The wounds of the comfort women are on display in a new exhibit in South Korea. Sandy Fortis from the I-24 News Culture magazine has the story. Do it! A joint ribbon cutting, a gesture of solidarity that announces the opening of a special exhibition in South Korea. It tells a sensitive story of the young women who were forced into prostitution under Japanese occupation during the Second World War. The most important evidence is the testimony of the victims. Nothing can be stronger as evidence than that. We created the special exhibition based on this evidence. The exhibition presents documents, drawings, and audio testimonials, all made by survivors of this tragic period, the so-called comfort women. Other than remind the public about the 200,000 Asian women who were abused, this exhibit also aims to promote recognition of the suffering by Japan. Through this exhibition, we hope that the Japanese government recognizes the problem of forced prostitution and apologizes, and the victims will forgive the Japanese government, which could lead to a peace in the region of Asia and the East. 
1993, Japan officially expressed regret about the sexual slavery. Since then, governments have tried to minimize the impact of these words. The Secretary General of the Japanese government, Yoshihide Suga, recently said he would form a committee to review and perhaps revise the apology made by his predecessor. However, Japan is struggling to cope with this part of its history. In January, it expressed strong dissatisfaction when the subject gained exposure in an exhibition at the famous International Comics Festival in Angoulême in France. The reaction did not stop the South Korean government from sponsoring the exhibition, which opened on March 1st, marking the 95th anniversary of its independence. Joining me on now is Odette Grober, host of I-24 News Culture Magazine. Good evening. Hello, Lucy. Uh, like you said, um, it's a special subject. We just uh, spoke about it. So, yes. Uh, let's try to look at um, South Korea, Japan. Relations are affected by the comfort woman? Well, yeah. Look, this is uh, uh, an, an old story, right? This is from World War II. But it still has a major effect on the relations between the countries. Um, We've seen this exhibition that, that shows how much this is still alive in, in South Korea, because South Korea, people there don't feel that Japan has mm, truthfully repented for, for what happened, and apparently for a good reason. We've just last week, uh, a, a spokesperson from the Japanese government say, said that Japan will re-examine the formal, the formal uh, uh, apology, it, um, it's known as the Kono Statement, it issued in 1993. So it's been 20 years since, since this formal apology, uh, where they said that basically, at least indirectly, Japan had something to do with, with. operating these these um, um, military-run brothels. Um, so what they're saying now is that they're going to go back and look at the historical evidence that they had at the time of you know writing the the apology and, and um, um, putting it out there. So it's still unknown what they'll do exactly. I'm not sure that well, that they'll actually, you know, scrap the whole thing and say actually we had nothing to do with it. But um, but they might. They still might. Um, and if they do, or if they go back at least a part of it, yeah. there there are going to be repercussions because South Korea will react. Um, just. You know, tomorrow the South Korean former mini foreign minister um, is supposed to speak at the UN Human Rights Council about this uh, this subject. Also, um, uh, South Korean President Park she also spoke about this, uh, saying that um, Japan should follow the the um, example set by Germany about repenting for for wrongdoings during uh, the Second World War. So this is very much alive. This is an ongoing issue. Uh, we can also see that in the ways that the Korea um, keeps this uh, keeps this in the public eye there's for instance about 45 minutes away from from Seoul there's a place called the house of sharing okay. it's uh, it's a place where even though we're talking about big numbers uh, so uh, there you know might be some other ways to commemorate this as well, well yeah this place this house of sharing is actually a sort of a retirement home for there aren't that many women still alive there are only yeah. a few right. dozens that are still alive and this house of sharing houses currently nine former comfort women the uh, youngest is now 84 years old she was barely a teen at the time yeah. which is pretty horrible um, and this place you know they they just live there in uh, in relative comfort there's also a museum right next to this uh, house of sharing where there are pictures documents all sorts of uh, uh, things that yeah you know, it's amazing each nation from this war from the second world war has its own memories yeah, and its, its own, own traumas uh, yes traumas from it and it's amazing to see how it's uh you know it in takes, israel it, yeah, you know, we're always looking at the holocaust yeah. and and other nations are a lot always of people are, are talking about the holocaust in this sense because the holocaust is remembered universally you know and this issue is an issue that kind of been put aside, kind of been pushed aside in Korea feels, uh, South Korea feels that it shouldn't be the case. Yes. Um, time will tell what time will, will tell, actually exactly. happen there. Well, Dada Grober, thank you very much sure for thing. this.
In Brazil, some of the top samba schools competed yesterday in the world-famous carnival parade that brings tourists from all around the world to Rio de Janeiro. Crowds of tens of thousands flocked the Rio's samba drum to take part in the colorful celebrations that feature uh, uh, costumes, those uh, famous samba drum beats and over the top display. The city's samba school are known for taking elaborate measures to impress and surprise the judges and audiences alike. And we're going out for four minutes break, four minutes, and then we're back for the I-24 News, the news today. Don't go anywhere. Four minutes, and I'll be back.